First off, thank you very much for attending this talk. I uh, definitely appreciate it after a whole night of hard drinking and partying. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as the title suggests, we'll be talking about things that you would be doing in your Docker or container pipeline, depending. Uh, so, we'll be talking about the threats that you face while you're playing with Docker, container the pipelines and integrity as you push images through your uh, various environments, uh, monitoring these activities, and uh, of course, making sure things are happening securely through uh, incident response planning, digital forensics, vulnerability management, and hardening. Hopefully we'll get some time for doing a, a live uh, memory forensics demo, uh, so let's cross our fingers for that. Um, threats. Container threats uh, are not that quite different compared to our traditional IT environments. We've got the cloud environments with the VMs come in, and now we have containers to deal with. Uh, quite similar. In the runtime, we have container uh, exploits that can cause your container to run malicious code. And uh, this could uh, result in resource exposure, such as your file system and uh, databases and other resources attached to it. Uh, as a result of this compromise, uh, the attacker might be able to break out of your container. Uh, scary, then you, they have access to your host and credentials stored there and other things that could lead to lateral movement. Cross-container attacks, yes, uh, so if you have other resources and other containers on the same host or different hosts, this can lead to more uh, information being compromised. And of course, uh, your <laughs> Denial of service attack uh, that can take down your systems and cause some reputation damage or even loss of revenue if you're not countering for that or planning ahead for your resources to be allocated properly. So, of course, you need to be careful about your data, uh, whether it's at rest or transport. Uh, if you're dealing with compliance frameworks, regulation, regulatory bodies and what's not, uh, which you probably are, uh, you have to make sure things are secured, uh, encrypted, uh, when they're stored, when they're passed on uh, to other resources. So you need to watch for the images themselves now. So you'll be pulling, pushing images. Uh, you'll be uh, rolling new images, uh, having your devs create new images. So it's going to go through lots of meat grinders, and the end product will be uh, sometimes unpredictable if you're not keeping track of things. Uh, so. Uh, Let's go and dive deeper. Mitigations, we've talked about the threats. So what do we do to make things more secure, visible, and uh, traceable? So talking about things. Uh, so I always like to use this unknown, known, and known uh, quote from Donald Rumsfeld. It was used yesterday again by the uh, great talk done by Aaron, the NCC group. I uh, really like his talk. If you haven't watched it, uh, make sure you catch up with it later. But uh, so in security, we always like to talk about known knowns, what we're knowing what we deal with, right? So a lot of things we know what's going on, but certain things are known but ignored or accepted risks. And there are the unknown unknowns that you don't know that you're accepting at all. So a lot of companies say, hey, we're secure because we haven't been hacked. Well, maybe you don't know about it. So a lot of com uh, security com uh, companies com came out last week saying, uh, hey, most companies at some point have been compromised or in the process of being compromised, and they have no idea about this. So what we are trying to do here uh, is to uh, counter all these threats, especially unknown unknowns, by uh, applying security at different levels. Um, so. To do this, we have basic uh, steps or, or stages uh, that Docker security uh, revolves around. So first off, we want to make sure we run on a secure platform. Our infrastructure needs to be uh, hardened, uh, monitored, and properly accessed. So we have access controls that we were talking about, content security for making sure images are properly uh, tracked uh, and uh, validated. And of course, we need to monitor all these things that are going on, store the logs, monitor them, and be scalable about this. Uh, 
in the event of a compromise, of course, it's going to happen. It's not a question of if, uh, but when, the classical mantra. Um, so to, that, to do that, obviously, you need to be prepared with an incident response plan, uh, policies, and testing, which we'll talk about uh, a bit, but not in much detail. So talking about the pipeline. Uh, as you're all aware, the, it all starts with the base OS image. Uh, and then it proceeds through various stages, including uh, going to the devs. So the base image gets supplied to the developers. The devs consume these. They add their apps onto it. And then they push it over to the dev uh, registry or repository. Breleng runs continuous integration tests, make sure things are proper, and then decides to push it to uh, production or other environments. So all these steps that uh, we are looking at here uh, have different requirements. All of them require monitoring. We want to know what's going on in every step. Uh, uh, we also want to know <laughs> what the steps are doing, right? Are they signing things properly? Are the devs making sure that they are signing their images as they are adding more components into the base OS image? If they're signing it, and if they're using a signed base image, we know that things haven't been uh, compromised while, th uh, while in transport. We want to make sure the devs are who they are. We don't want an attacker randomly picking up an image using uh, maybe a compromised certificate and pushing images over to production. Uh, the monitoring should be picking up that. Also, RelEng and other various layers of mitigations should be keeping an eye on it. Um, uh, image vulnerability scans are important as well because although you're doing a good effort in hardening your infrastructure, your images, your hosts, things are going to slip. And you want to be uh, doing these vulnerability scans in an automated fashion, both uh, looking at the content of your containers, your hosts, what libraries are exposed, what network ports are exposed, and also what third-party libraries are being integrated into your code that you have no idea that, about their vulnerabilities. Uh, that's always what gets people. They have third-party libraries included. They don't know if it's patched or not because it's not within scope. They only pay attention to their own code base. <laughs> but you'll have these dependencies that will cause you major pain later down the line if you don't keep an eye on them. Um, after all these, of course, being prepared, incident response is always the last stage. Uh, digital forensics, which is part of it, which is discovering what really happened, if possible, attribution, the root cause, and the eventual lessons learned, and how do you integrate it back into this cycle to improve this cycle. It's a continuous improvement cycle that you have to go through it. It's, it's, it takes a lot of work, a lot of planning, uh, automation, and uh, executive buy-in. Yeah, that's the key word. <laughs> um, so uh, let's go in a bit more detail. Access control authentication. Uh, what we want to do in these environments is keep track of who has access to what, and they can access things in a given time frame. So uh, leveraging LDAP over SSL for image tra transactions, whether it's push-pull, becomes important because you want to have the devs, the, the devs that really need access have the access, and RelEng have access to uh, and visibility into all these images. Also, the service accounts need to have proper access to do their automated uh, continuous integration testing and uh, other security service related access as well for scanning and, uh, uh, let's say, integrity testing. Um, so for environments that uh, you won't be really supporting LDAP, uh, authentication, you can leverage mutual uh, authentication based on TLS certificates, which uh, in production for fast, uh, let's say, transactions, this turns out to be uh, more efficient. So in the diagram, uh, just flowing a, showing a basic flow, uh, the dev systems, as they push to the dev registry, they have to do it over LDAP authentication. They won't be able to do so without authenticating. And also this whole push and pull happens over HTTPS. All these different levels, except the last one, involves HTTPS, SSL, and uh, uh, LDAP-based authentication that also happens over SSL. 
the uh, continuous integration solution also uh, conducts its transactions over secure channels. So uh, by using secure channels, what you're doing here is making sure that data in transport is not a, let's say, uh, compromise. So the classic man-in-the-middle man attack is, is feasible if you're not securing your uh, transports. So somebody could modify your binary or your image and inject some sort of uh, code into your container and execute their own malicious software or malware, and you won't know about it. And hopefully, which we'll be talking about in the next one, your signing will take care of that man in the middle attack, even if you're exposed. Uh, so if the images you're producing are signed and properly tracked in a Docker trusted registry, um, you will be able to have an account of the transactions related to these images. So uh, most companies like Salesforce or the Salesforce subsidiaries are going to be using on-premise uh, registries. And most transactions, almost all of them, are going to be done over LDAP and uh, specifically SSL. So we also have a separation of images. Uh, so we have, based, uh, based on users, dev images and prod images uh, are uh, kept in separate registries, and they are part of different stages of the life cycle that I had showed to you. And, um, when images are pulled, they will be validated by this automated platform. Uh, Docker, uh, Docker provides a great, uh, uh, let's say, tool that provides uh, transparent image validation based on signatures. So it will only take one line of uh, config for you to run, and, uh, which is the Docker content trust. And it will make sure that the images that are being transacted are properly signed uh, by people who are known to the environment. So the Docker notary uh, handles this, uh, works with the registry, and it provides uh, accountability and hopefully attribution as to who has created the image when things happened. And uh, as the images flow through your environment, haven't been compromised. Um, so the notary master here. Uh, acts like the broker, makes sure all your transactions are accountable, so the continuous integration environment builds and tests your uh, apps and your uh, other services that you're pushing. It signs it, pushes it to the notary master, and then the prod or other DMZ services uh, consume these images, uh, of, of course, after validating them. So this gives a higher uh, level picture of how all these stages work with each other. I would like to thank uh, Andre Falco of Salesforce also for uh, putting this uh, infrastructure together. Uh, it becomes it's challenging, especially for uh, having Docker infrastructure fit in with what's already existing and the different uh, rules we need to work with within the environment. So as you can see, the dev systems push images to the dev docker registry over LDAP SSL. And uh, later, this gets consumed by the continuous integration platform. Bugs get reported to the ticketing system. And then release engineering makes sure these are cleared and then pushes it over to the master docker registry. Uh, also, at the same time, images are signed and posted to the notary master. And as they get consumed by the DMZ and prod environments, they are validated. Uh, of course, the whole transactions are done over secure channels to prevent uh, tampering of various parties that might be in your environment. So let's talk about hardening. Uh, this involves the host and the containers. The host is pretty traditional. Everyone should be familiar with how to make a host more secure compared to what comes out, out of the box or after a fresh install. Uh, the most important part that people miss is frequent patching. Uh, a lot of people have various uh, 
uh, levels of SLAs or various levels of uh, timelines to patch them. With containers, though, it becomes a really fluid environment where you need to be sure that what you're running is uh, what's on disk and what's running is properly patched. So host patching the host is the first step. If your base is secure, if you know it's up to date and you're not uh, open to the latest vulnerabilities reported publicly, of course, you can't do much about the O days, uh, you, you should be ahead of the, the crowd. But to protect for the unknown unknowns, what you would like to do is minimize your attack service, uh, surface by uh, minimizing the amount of components you are uh, including on your images. So things like compilers or other types of shells or uh, <laughs> Perl or any other type of uh, uh, scripting language should not be included. Uh, in your host if possible. Most of the compile time things uh, should be isolated to your dev environment. Uh, you probably would have some scripting to uh, do uh, admin related tasks, but that should be the only limited uh, to uh, certain binaries. Uh, and you shouldn't be really exposing your scripting languages to regular users or, uh, for example, the Docker user. So uh, to protect your memory and kernel on the host, you sh it's recommended by a lot of security professionals to use GR security packs. So it, what this uh, does is it uh, basically prevents your uh, runtime from being tampered by attackers in the event of a compromise and makes it really difficult for uh, attackers to inject code uh, that they want to run that uh, will give rise to further compromise of your infrastructure. Um, another thing that attacker, attackers do is they, they like to replace your binaries, such as your SSH uh, service. And what they do is they dump your credentials or your, uh, your keys, and they use this to uh, further uh, expand their hold on your environment by spreading into your other systems. Um, also, obviously, you want to use or leverage the Linux isolation capabilities. Docker already provides lots of uh, tools for you but you should even go further in making sure things are not exposed or easily available to uh, attackers that eventually are gonna get on your system. Uh, so containers. Um, the main challenge that we sometimes face is uh, the speed of patching. I keep coming back to this, but it becomes really important to include the latest patches and the latest uh, software on your systems because it's there are several benefits. One is performance sometimes, sometimes not, obviously. <laughs> but you'll get the benefit of having a more secure platform uh, and not worry about the low-hanging fruits. Uh, and it makes it easier for your investigators knowing that you're running the latest code base. And if, and if, if something happens, they won't have to deal with all these different use cases or different uh, attack trees that would be possible if you're running vulnerable uh, applications or software. So you should also leverage user namespaces to have privilege separation and make sure you're running as the lowest privileged user on your hosts. Uh, so it, that also minimizes the amount of damage that an attacker can do. Um, as on the host, you should, generally speaking, not include things such as compilers or SSH access or any kind of shell environment in your container if you can avoid doing so. It's sometimes tough because people or devs like to hop on uh, the images and test stuff. While that is great in the dev environments, in production this should not be allowed. So production images should not include all these uh, different components that might increase the attack surface. Other things to do is, as we already mentioned, is using the privilege flag and the read-only flag. It might think, make things a bit more difficult for you to run, uh, but uh, it's, it would be great if you could uh, do read-only uh, to provide immutability of the containers. Um, also, limiting access to the Docker user and groups. That seems to be the most... <laughs> A lot of questions we get about this is, hey, uh, we have devs that have uh, Docker group membership. Uh, is this secure? Well, <laughs> you, don't, you might not want to give that level of access to your uh, devs. Or even better, they shouldn't have access to your prod environments to begin with. 
So, uh, we, uh, as you know, Docker group access provides you uh, really high privileges and that could provide access into your uh, containers and the resources they have. Um, also, you want to limit the amount of access the containers have to your host resources or any other network-based resource. Uh, as, and they should only have access to what they need to have access to. It's like need-to-know basis, uh, as a lot of security folk like to say. Uh, Docker has been doing a great job in providing guidelines and security measures for uh, their users. So one of the tools they have is Docker Bench for security. It provides a, a baseline uh, assessment of your environment and will provide a long list of things that you should fix if you haven't. These are suggestions. Some of them are really, uh, uh, let's say, strict uh, things to, that you could do. Some of them are uh, things that you should be doing uh, to begin with, uh, like users uh, isolated to non-Docker groups. Um, so if you follow these best practices, uh, generally speaking, you should be in a safe place uh, from a hardening perspective. So the other aspect of uh, hardening is making sure you have a vulnerability management program. So a lot of people think that vulnerability and vulnerabilities under management is doing a scan or running through a scanner and pretty much checking off whatever's been reported that's only critical. Well, there is more related, there, there are more things related to that. So, but going to the basics, you should be scanning your image images uh, as to making sure that the code, the base image and the code running on the base image has been properly uh, patched, right? You don't want uh, libraries included in there that uh, have vulnerabilities or any other OS level uh, vulnerabilities. There was recently a, a publicly hosted image on the Docker registry that still had a, a libc a vulnerable library included there. So anyone running that potentially was uh, exposed to that vulnerability. So even if things are publicly hosted, don't trust them. Run it through your own scanners. Make sure uh, things are uh, <laughs> what you expect them to be. So trust but verify. That's what I'd like to say always. Um, so oh, scanning the hosts and containers of uh, for what they have inside is important. Also, as they run, you want to make sure uh, that what they're exposing to the network is also something that you're expecting. So, uh, let's say devs might include extra code in there that are not obvious in the first look that they are actually launching network services and exposing ports, which you might not be monitoring. So that could be problematic. So the network scans it becomes important for making sure what's running in your environment is what you expect. And also sometimes uh, rogue services uh, or rogue containers can be detected this way. Um, going back to the source code, uh, you also sh should be keeping track of the source code itself, uh, doing manual and static code analysis, well, uh, automated static code analysis. This obviously is a whole different topic to, to talk about, but code signing becomes really important as well. You're signing your container images, you should have your code signed and make sure it's uh, properly passed on by uh, devs and users you know about. Um, we already talked about the scanning aspect of it, but. Uh, the remediation part becomes important where uh, you want to make sure things are patched timely. So that delta T there becomes pretty variable if, depending on which company, which environment you're in. It could be four months after a critical vulnerability has been reported or it could be a day. So people or companies have uh, different priorities uh, or uh, reputations to protect. People who really worry about it have a shorten, uh, shorter SLA and prioritization uh, plan based on the level of risk that's been reported. So uh, you want to have a system and people looking at this, tracking them, making sure things are being pushed through and patched properly. Uh, you want this to be documented and uh, owned by a high, high level group that can keep or hold people accountable. It's, 
it's, it's accepted in the community that uh, certain groups of uh, people in, the, in, the, in co companies will uh, prefer to hold back their patches because it will break uh, certain, let's say, services. Uh, well, that's, people would always prefer to have a higher uptime, but sometimes having a higher uptime means you're running expose, uh, risky components that might cause you more downtime. So it's always a trade-off that you need to have there. Do you want to have a short downtime to patch, or you want to have a longer downtime? So once you have patched things, uh, you want to make sure uh, that the containers or the base images are the ones that are uh, running on your hosts. So we also, uh, so as a security professional, uh, I've seen interesting cases where, okay, you patch the base image, you patch the code itself, but then you also have containers that's been running there and haven't been relaunched. So that's a problem, right? You might think you're secure because you patched, but what's in memory doesn't match with what's in disk. So that's something that you need to keep in mind after you've uh, patched systems or updated systems. So, uh, We've made sure things are properly secured. Hopefully, we're hardened and uh, running things through secure channels and securing things on, uh, at rest. Well, we want to know still what's going on, right? You want to do monitoring. You want to know uh, what's going on in your network, what's happening on your endpoints, what's happening within the memory. So network infrastructure is one place where you'll see everything that needs to talk outbound or inbound. Uh, so what you want to first do is make sure you have the proper infrastructure in place to be able to see um, the transactions going uh, between the resources you're exposing. So we, generally speaking, in uh, the environment that we support, we have uh, the, the networking plumbed through our physical uh, infrastructure as much as we can so we can have more account accountability of the containers, uh, see what traffic they're uh, processing and responding to, and make sure we are uh, analyzing this traffic properly. So as you can see, we're capturing traffic both on the physical network and on the host that the dockers are uh, creating, piping it through an IDS NetFlow engine, uh, generating uh, behavioral network information. So NetFlow is pretty much as uh, it is an accepted behavioral and, and behavioral way of looking at network traffic. The IDSs provide your baseline. It's like the network AV, <laughs> but you should have it regardless because sometimes uh, you will have uh, things happening before a real attack. An attacker will scan your network if they've compromised the host, but they will just see if there's any low-hanging fruit. IDSs will catch that most of the time. Without, before the advanced attack happens. Um, obviously, then you need to pipe all these logs into a SIM or a log um, aggregating monitoring solution where you can process this data and make it more human readable and actionable. Um, so things that you're looking at on your network, you're looking at what the containers are talking to each other what, you're, what the containers are saying to your hosts or receiving, and also how your containers interact with your resources, your databases, Hadoop clusters, you name it. Um, knowing and having a baseline on this traffic it gives you an idea when a delta happens. It gives you the opportunity to say, hey, this is an outlier. We should take a look at this. Resource monitoring has helped lots of companies to catch attackers before they've dumped the database and leaked it outbound. Or just seeing a spike on your network traffic actually can uh, give you somewhat of a predictor as to there's something funny going on here, let's take a look. But if you don't have any monitoring place, if you're not piping your network traffic through various uh, uh, solutions such as NetFlow or IDS or full packet capture, you, you won't be able to see what's going on or de dive deeper. Sometimes you want to know, okay, we've seen the spike. What is that traffic? Uh, is it uh, a, a, an attack disguised 
like uh, SSL or is it uh, SSH going over port 443 somewhere? So that becomes an interesting way of looking at it. So most of the time, attackers are going to compromise your system, and there will be exfiltrating or talking outbound for further commands. Um, so, uh, a bit more detail what you should be looking for or look capturing on hosts is the logs. You want to have all logs. Some people say, oh, we'll just have authentication logs. No, that's not really going to be enough. You want to have any log possible to have a full picture of what's transpiring on your hosts. Uh, if you have the budget or resources, you would like to uh, analyze these, uh, uh, this data with machine learning. Um, anomaly detection is a, is a phrase being used a lot nowadays in the security community, but you want to be uh, doing or scaling properly to be able to monitor and act on these things. Um, all right, and the, and the containers, you want to do the same thing, capture all the logs, both the uh, OS component logs and the application logs. Application logs also do authentication. They also have logs as to, hey, somebody ran this query, or somebody accessed this resource, or this query resulted in a million rows of uh, customer data, and we need to know why a user or something is dumping a million records. That becomes an interesting question to answer once you come it across. And also, at, from an attribution standpoint, having containers tracked on the network base, it gives you better attribution as to what's been compromised and uh, gives you, uh, saves time from a root cause analysis perspective. Um, other things that you should be looking at is disk activity monitoring, uh, the file system integrity with uh, various tools that are available there, free as well as paid, uh, because you want to keep an eye on the config files, the binaries, make sure they're what you expect. Um, Runtime layer monitoring can be provided by different vendors. Also, there are open source solutions, which I'll talk about one aspect of it uh, later in the digital forensics part, uh, which is the memory monitoring. <laughs> so uh, you can actually look at the memory in runtime and make sure things are transpiring as they're supposed to, meaning the binaries match what's in memory, or the processes that are emitting network traffic uh, are actually talking uh, well, the, when you look at the network layer or versus what's on the host or container, you might see discrepancies. So this discrepancy based on, detected based on either memory forensics analysis or memory analysis can, be, can provide you a good starting point. In forensics, uh, let's hop into it. In forensics, the most important question is where do we start at? You usually get a... Uh, say, a, a call in the middle of the night in the morning saying, hey, we got an incident, bad stuff happened. And you're like, okay, what's the bad stuff? <laughs> and then uh, if you don't have a starting point or something, a, a lead, it becomes a really finding a needle in a haystack. So if you have proper monitoring in place and visibility into what you're doing, it provides your incident response guys a good, start to, a, a good starting point and uh, le lets them mitigate uh, things much faster. So things are moving towards incident mitigation, as in we want to shorten the amount of time it takes for this incident to be closed. And to be able to do that, you have to have the capabilities to respond. And the capabilities include you know, having visibility into your memory, whether it's real time or close to real time, or having periodic memory dumps and analyzing them. <coughs> the capability to uh, do disk forensics. So nowadays, nobody's dumping full disk images anymore. We're, everyone's focusing on specific disk uh, artifacts. So you won't really do, be doing full disk forensics, but you should be able to uh, uh, do disk uh, level artifacts and generate uh, timelines. So we already talked about the networking side. Uh, we'll briefly talk. So let's talk about disk forensics. We'll be based on the disk artifacts. We'll be Building super timelines. What are super timelines? It's a big picture. Most people are familiar with uh, these log aggregators, monitors, uh, provide you a, a, 
a holistic view of what's going on. But from a forensic standpoint, you need more data as to figuring out when a, a certain incident started. So you want to know, uh, for example, the file system uh, access times, uh, hashes. You want to know about uh, the events as they correlate to your file system, uh, application events as they correlate to your file system events. So you want to be able to see all the different levels of activities as they transpire to be able to see what got compromised, where did they spread, if any data has been exposed. Um, so the tools that you would use traditionally is SleuthKit, uh, Plaza to build a timeline that integrates all these artifacts. And if you, have, if you need to get access to the raw disk and carve out, let's say, malicious binaries, you could use DD or uh, Scalpel or other types of forensics tools. Uh, memory forensics, which uh, is my passion because why? Nothing can hide in memory. Anything that needs to run needs to exist in memory at some point. Um, even if things are garbage collected, they're going to be there briefly in memory, probably for, I don't know, five to ten minutes. So if you're fast enough, you can probably extract an artifact. In one of my talks that I gave a couple of years ago, I was able to dump uh, Bitcoin uh, keys and other artifacts from memory even after a certain time uh, the transaction had occurred. So that gives you a good starting point from an attribution standpoint. Um, also, it's quite faster compared to uh, disk forensics. So you won't actually have to sift through terabytes of data nowadays. You'll only have to focus on a smaller uh, representation uh, of what's running and what's doing things. So the diagram kind of shows the basics. You have the, your RAM that uh, Docker is running on probably, and then you have the tools that, le uh, that can help you to dump that memory into a sample or provide access to live memory and then analyze it and uh, let you access this information as if a database so you can query it and see what's running in memory uh, and do uh, or decide on how you want to act. Um, so uh, access, you could access memory as memory samples by just dumping it, running tools such as Lime or LinPmem, or you can access it live by other memory, uh, other modules that expose your memory as a slash dev or, or a device. Um, the, for analysis, the, the, my favorite tool is the, the Volatility Framework. The Volatility Framework is an open source project that's been going on for years and lets you make sense of the memory dump. It currently supports Windows, Mac, Android, Linux, and uh, other ARM-based platforms, and it, it's a, a really useful toolkit if you're doing if you need to do forensics. So just talk about what memory forensics does for you. Um, so this is quite familiar. It's a PS3 uh, view of things. But when you're looking in memory, the memory structures you're accessing can actually provide you a historical view of things. So processes that might not exist, in, and if you run PS3 from your command line, uh, are going to be visible in memory because the, if there's a rootkit on your host running, it might have hooked your API calls or your syscalls and might be hiding the processes in there. So any other rogue for example, a container running there or a rogue process kind of masquerading as Docker containers can be detected this way by looking at the parent-child relationship. Uh, other things we talked about are uh, looking at resources, what's available. Um, the TMPFS plugin or module in the, the volatility framework lets you view uh, the temporary uh, file system and sometimes when you're running your container based on the temporary file system, you might want to know what's going on, right? Have a list of things that are exposed uh, and know what container is accessing the resources exposed on the disk or memory. Um, another thing is, is that you want to counter for is uh, your components that are being used or consumed on the host or by your containers. So you want to know, for example, if you're, if you're uh, being sideloaded, meaning is code being in injected in a form of a library. So uh, this tool, by just being able to list what's in memory as to what uh, libraries are executed, uh, are being executed, just lets you detect the, sh the injections and manipulations. Um, 
So process integrity monitoring also becomes interesting because nowadays most exploits, they won't write to disk and they'll be uh, doing everything in memory and since things are not being bounced a lot, uh, it, or containers, they will be doing a lot of processing. They won't be bounced as, as frequently as you would imagine. They'll be uh, patching the memory, uh, doing their uh, malicious acts, exfilling data, or spreading lateral emails probably. So what you, this solution provides, it provides a way to compare what's on disk and memory, make sure things in memory haven't been tampered with. So I just modified a, the Docker binary uh, in a, a quick and easy one just for the demo and running this plugin just show that there's a difference between what's on disk and in memory. So the top one is disk, bottom one is uh, memory. So instead of 9.0, it's 9.1. Trivial, but if other things are modified, it becomes problematic. Um, I was planning to do a demo, but I don't have enough time for that, unfortunately, I apologize. Uh, but just to summarize, what it takes to secure your pipeline, right? You want to focus on four main topics, platform security, content security, access controls, monitoring, and response. So platform security, obviously, you went to isolating your resources and containers. You hardened them, made sure they're secure, not running any unpatched vulnerable code. And you're following recommended best practices by your container provider, especially Docker. And you're doing your vulnerability scans. You're making sure also what you're signing, providing to your, uh, your devs and to production are accounted for. You're not pushing, uh, or you're not pulling uh, tampered images. Uh, also, uh, you're, prop you're using what's being provided by the ecosystem to track all these things, such as the Docker registry, Docker notary, and so on and so forth. Access control is really important. You want to know <laughs> who is acting in your environment, and make sure all your transactions are happening over uh, TLS or SSL. This will uh, bring up the, attack, the bar for the attacker to compromise your environments uh, much more than <laughs> you would expect. Uh, monitoring response, you have to always plan ahead. You have to make sure that you're ready to act if something happens. You need to be planning and have an incident response plan uh, and test it regularly, right? A lot of people have a plan on paper, but they don't run through it. They don't know who's supposed to be included in it, right? The roles need to get updated. People who are acting in different capacities need to be updated and, and test it quarterly at least, right? You, <laughs> this is something that's missed a lot, uh, but being pushed by the compliance frameworks nowadays. Uh, so it's tough to avoid, but it still happens. Uh, vulnerability management, it's not only about uh, patching, it's about making sure things are happening in a timely manner. There's attribution, patterns are detected as to why vulnerabilities are being uh, included in your image, whether it's code or uh, through the base image creation. And you wanna be able to know what's going on in your environment. Network is a must, because everything that needs to be, that is compromised, will talk outbound, whether frequently or infrequently. In one case, there was a, a compromise that was t talking, emitting traffic just every two months. If you're not really looking for that tra type of traffic, infrequent or frequent traffic, you won't see it. Uh, your logs also are not gonna help you, but having logs are gonna really help you with the uh, uh, low-hanging fruits, having baselines, and being able to see the delta. Forensics will help you in root cause analysis and gauging the amount of damage that has been done by the potential attacker. And it will definitely provide a good lessons learned for the devs, infrastructure groups, and other executive level people so they can allocate resources and spend more time, for example, for, or spend more resources for dev to write secure code and just not push them to deliver in X amount of days. So, um, well, I would like to thank everyone who has attended. I would like to uh, thank my colleagues from Salesforce. They've been great support and, and the company as well. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, feel free. Uh, I have the references for this talk listed on my slide deck. And uh, thank you. So 
Um, there's not actually another session directly after this. We are out of our time slot, though, but because there isn't anything directly after, we can maybe take five minutes if people do have questions. If you do have a question, there is a microphone in the aisle there. We are recording, so please, all questions into the mic. When five minutes is up, I'm going to have to call it, though, okay? Okay, that'll be fine. Uh, I'll be quick. Uh, thank you. I learned a lot from this. Okay, so some of the questions is, um, I'm currently using IronIO. I'm deploying lots of, of, of apps and containers. One of the things you didn't address is, I'm pulling th stuff from third-party APIs. What can I deal with security from pulling from third-party APIs? I'm also sharing information using uh, cache that is so IronIO has a caching solution so, so, so other containers can pull off that cache. I'm, I'll, I'll do it offline, just curious about those two questions. Well, that's a different, it's an interesting question, not directly related to containers, obviously, but from an API standpoint, you want to make sure all the traffic is going over it. Uh, secure channels, authentication using keys or credentials, right? And logging becomes really important as to what's being queried when. Your caches, hopefully not everybody has access to those. Uh, Right? <laughs> it's, 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 it, the containers have access. So curious, if, if I have a cache that's going across containers, is that considered a vulnerability within, uh, within a Docker container? Would, would I have vulnerability? So the containers that have or need to process the cache have access to it and no other container has access to it, that's fine. All the containers have access to it. So that's a problem, right? You don't want all the containers to have access to that. You could either do that through network level uh, let's say firewalling, if you, it depends on your, how you do your network plumbing, obviously. Uh, or uh, you can do a resource. Docker provides a good interface for limiting who can talk to who and over what port. So you can leverage that as well. Obviously, we have a large <laughs> uh, amount of containers running that becomes problematic, hence automation. And I'm sure there's a vendor that has a solution for you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Early in the talk, you mentioned uh, keeping an eye on third-party libraries. Um, if the developers have access to the Docker file, it seems pretty easy for them to do that. Kind of, you know, not intentionally malicious, but like, how in practice do you do that? How do you know if someone adds something new, or what do you have out there, and how many copies in it, what versions? Yeah. So first off, uh, you don't let uh, you wouldn't actually let people download random base images and and push them into let's say the dev registry we have a you know tight controls over that so if a dev downloads a public image modifies it adds its own code and tries to push it it's not going to work because of the signing that's going on right i so thinking more like a, like adding apt get lib something oh that kind of thing so if they are rolling a, their own Docker file? Well, well, that was my question. Like, do your devs, oh, are sorry. your devs allowed to do that? And if so, how do you know if they do? So the base to, images are controlled by the, the infrastructure team. So the devs don't have access to those. So they won't be able to add anything to the base image. They can add their own layers of code that's only a, a, the cap, based on the capabilities provided by the base image. And Relenge makes sure that the code that needs to run uh, has access to only the things, for example, Java, right? Nothing else. So you can't really roll your own uh, base image and push it over. There are checks in the way to prevent that from happening. You always need a gatekeeper. OK, thanks. Thank you. Hi, a quick question on the networking part. You mentioned about the firewall and the IDS and all of that. Sure. So now, are these appliances container aware, or they're just inspecting all the traffic which is coming out of the host? So, uh, yeah, it's tough to scroll back to that slide. But uh, so, network monitoring is happening in both the network, the regular physical layer, and also at the container, uh, let's say bridge, that the uh, dockers or the containers talk to each other. So we're monitoring pretty much everything that's transpiring within the environment, both within the physical realm and uh, but for the two containers. containers talking to each other, possibly on the same host, how are you inserting a firewall in that path? So for containers talking to each other, they're different. It always depends on your plumbing, right? So if in, in specific environments, you can uh, make the traffic actually go outside of the host 
and then come back. Sure. And then in your firewalling, you can provide different security zones. Right. And that's one approach. And if you really want to be more granular, you can do it in your container environment as well. That the, leveraging Docker. Uh, and in that case, you're using IP table rules um, for the. That's possible as well, okay. yes. But I was interested in, in your particular example with Salesforce. What is the approach you guys are taking, and, and how are you guys firewall? So we can take that question sure. offline. I'll, I'll, I'll because, check. Yeah, yeah I can only speak about so much. <laughs> Last question. So it's kind of a continuation of what he was saying. I talked to David Lawrence. It's um, Docker. And basically, he's on the security team. And he had this view that applications should have SSL connectivity all the way into the application. So you had an, a diagram up there that you were going to show him. But basically, it shows your network structure is doing monitoring before it gets to the container. you have an opinion on that view? Uh, More of a uh, philosophical view. I, I couldn't really hear your question. I'm sorry. Oh, the last part. Yes, so basically, if you have end-to-end -end encryption with an application, sure. which might be a philosophical view, what's your stance on that? With I noticed you had some network monitoring where you watch the traffic as it comes into your network. Yeah, sure. As far as encrypted network traffic, the, you're looking at it, so if you don't, if you're not leveraging your private keys to decrypt the traffic on the fly, what you can do is uh, uh, look at the NetFlow behavioral aspect of it and look at patterns of traffic that's not regular within your environment. So whether it's talking on usual ports or whether it's traffic spikes or whether it's endpoints that are not usually talking are talking to each other, that's a, a giveaway as well. So you might not have visibility based on what's provided to you, but you have visibility as to what's going across the network. And in your view, of it, that's a good way of doing it or offloading the SSL certificates? Is that a good way to? Yeah, well, application to application inside your network or to the internet. Yeah, it, it, you should use SSL certificates application to application. Uh, okay. It should be encrypted. And if you want to see what's transpiring, and most of the time it's a lot of traffic to look at. Let's say if you want to look at your Hadoop traffic, that's going to be uh, close to impossible to really store all that information, right? You pretty much have a copy of your Hadoop cluster stand, sitting somewhere. Yeah. So you want to really look at the patterns of network traffic rather than what's going on inside of it. And in case of an incident, you will have that stored somewhere, maybe your full network packet captured. Then you can do a deep dive, having your SSL search to decrypt it. Okay. So it, it, it all depends on the level of contingencies and how deep you want to dig and your SLAs as to what's your responsibility and uh, as to uh, root cause analysis and the responsibility is how much information you need to provide to your end users to, as to the level of compromise. So different institutions have different responsibilities and yeah. uh, you know, you stories go. to tell to their people. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Jem. Thanks, everybody, for your questions.